Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 272, recorded on December 21st, 2022. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. Raspberry Pi's CEO, Eben Upton, joined Christopher Barnett from Explaining Computers and updated us on the state of the Pi, including a recently secured deal to buy chips from Samsung. One of the reoccurring themes of the interview was just how challenging the supply chain has been for the firm to navigate in the last couple of years. You can't get back the fab capacity that wasn't used in 2020. And so the combination of that negative going supply shock and positive going demand shock um, generated a shortage. Um, that shortage persists. Um, the, uh, the semiconductor supply chain was in any case very tight anyway. There was not an enormous amount of spare capacity. Um, so it generates a, uh, a mismatch, a shortage situation, which is hard to get out of. Of course, one of the problems, as we found out in other ways with you know, toilet paper and hand sanitizer during the pandemic, is once the impression takes hold that there is a shortage, um, the shortage becomes self-reinforcing. And you start to see hoarding behavior. You start to see people's uh, purchasing behavior change in the anticipation of shortages. And that makes the shortages worse. So that's kind of what's happened across the whole semiconductor supply chain. Um, it's affected some consumers, some consumers of semiconductors more than others. Obviously, the car companies are probably the, uh, the, the the kind of the wildest example of a world in which you know a twenty thousand pound piece of metal uh, and plastic um, can be immobilized in a parking lot for one for for want of a one dollar uh, engine management. Um, I see. So you've seen a lot of that. It's affected us a little bit, and we've worked hard to to, to get around it. Um, uh, but um, I guess the kind of the good news is we are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel, and I would say we have probably an eighty percent certainty that it's not an express train, uh, that it really is the it really is the end of the tunnel. How you managed your supply chain and inventory levels these last couple of years has really been a make or break it factor for a lot of companies. We've covered some companies that seem to have done a much better job, and I think we can probably all think of a few companies who've done much worse. But it does seem like things are getting better. Eben announced recently on their blog that 100,000 units have been secured for single unit sales. That's what they call regular retail customers, i.e. you and me. Uh, but it seems as for the past couple of years during these supply constraints, as many of us suspected and feared, Boring old cheap retail customers were just completely taking a back seat to their big customers. Um, I guess the biggest positive thing that's happened all the way through this is we've been able to sustain our OEM customers. So one of the interesting things that's happened with Raspberry Pi, you know, we are a hobbyist or, you know, if you think about, still think about our orientation, how we think about ourselves, uh, you know, the hobbyist in education, the enthusiast in education community is still really, really, really important to us. But as a share of our overall production, um, several years ago, uh, industrial and embedded customers came to dominate um, our, our, our customer base by volume. This meant those customers were getting their orders filled while the rest of us just got to wait. In that blog post Chris mentioned, Upton acknowledged the community's uh, patience and offers the 100,000 units made up of Raspberry Pi 0Ws, 3A Pluses, and Raspberry Pi 4s in the 2 gig and 4 gig varieties for single unit sale. Now, we don't know the breakdown of how many of each model there's going to be, but Upton does indicate that it's likely the Pi 0W will come back into stock first. As for when we might see a whole new Pi? Well, for that, we might have to wait until 2025. Um, so I think we are... Um, don't expect a Pi 5 next year, I think would be the... You know, next year is a, is a recovery year. So on the one hand, it's kind of slowed us down. On the one hand, it's... On the other hand, it's slowed everything down. Um, and so there's merit, I think, in us spending a year before we look at introducing anything new, spending a year recovering. KDE Plasma fans are getting a little hyped, well, at least I am, about the work they'll be starting soon on Plasma 6. But before we get there, the development team has released KDE Frameworks 5.101. And in my opinion, what is notable about this release, besides the fixes and improvements that are actually really great to see, is that it's effectively the final release of the 5 series. The development team now turns their attention towards KDE Frameworks 6. Yeah, I guess that's been the plan for a while now, with KDE Frameworks 5, of course, still seeing maintenance updates going forward. What's quite exciting for me in this, though, 
is it means we're getting close to the final version of the 5 series for the Plasma desktop as a whole. The upcoming 527 release is also planned to be the last before real work begins on Plasma 6, integrating Qt 6, and a whole lot more. That's going to be something to watch, just to see where they set their goals and what they get to and how that transition actually ends up for end users. We're going to keep an eye on all that and report back, of course. But sticking with the desktop for just another moment, it was also great to see that XFCE 4.18 released just a little bit after we published last week. Almost two years of work went into 4.18, and the project says a gazillion bug fixes and various minor improvements also went into the release. I mean, I think it really comes together. <laughs> it looks like a really nice release. In fact... It's kind of got me eyeballing it because I think Nick's just got it packaged up. So I'm kind of considering giving this release of XFCE 4.18 a go. I could kind of, I could kind of see it making a really nice, lean, mean gaming desktop or gaming laptop setup too. So I may give this a try and report back. The little holiday elves in your audio subsystem have a gift for you. It's Pipewire 0.3.62 which has just been released. It includes one feature I think you and the audience are going to like. Heck yes. I, I think they might not even realize they wanted this feature until we mention it. Because uh, I was digging through the new Pipewire release notes, and this feature they recently added struck me. It's called Bluetooth Offloading. I'm like, oh, okay, what's this? Well, it's like another way of saying hardware accelerated Bluetooth. The idea is, Pipewire will completely offload the reception, decoding, and playback handling to the hardware, which means less for the OS to do, lower CPU usage, and thus lower power draw. Now, to get this fancy new hardware support and improved efficiency, well, some updates were also needed in WirePlumber. That's the Pipewire session and policy manager that sort of makes sure all the bits get connected where they need to go on your actual running system. Thankfully, that support landed just in the last week with version 0.4.13. But back on Pipewire, a regression was noticed, thankfully caught and now fixed in this release, which should significantly improve screen sharing on Wayland. There's also some new video metadata that indicates if a video was transformed, like being flipped or rotated. LibCamera and GStreamer have been updated to support this new metadata, now, all we need is just some applications up the stack to build in support. Linode.com slash LAN. That's where you go to get $100 in 60-day credit on a new account, and it's a great way to support the show while you're checking out fast, reliable cloud hosting. That's what Linode is. It's the best in the business in so many categories that matter. Performance, price, support, and one that I think matters to me, and I think a lot of you out there, is community support. You know it. We've demonstrated it here with their support for Jupiter Broadcasting, our road trips, our meetups. But they also sponsor a lot of our favorite open source projects with infrastructure. They participate in a lot of community activities and just creators in this space as well. There's that element that I think shows they're savvy. They invest in the community around them because they know, having done this for nearly 19 years, that's how you flourish things in free software and open source. And on top of that, they've got a great product offering. The best performance out there I've tested, 11 data centers for you to choose from with a dozen more coming online. Things like object storage that are compatible with S3, cloud firewalls that block the traffic from ever, ever getting to your rig in the first place. Infrastructure management tools like Ansible, Terraform, Kubernetes. If you want to use it, they support it. Great backups that are easy to understand, quick to restore. All of that, plus support that's available 365 by phone, email, or ticket, whatever you want. Tier one support right there. You call it, they answer your question. They help you right there. They don't do the escalation thing. They don't make you go all these different hoops and games. It's powerful. I challenge you to go try it. Go build something. Go learn something. See what I've been talking about and support the show. Linode's what we use. I think you're going to love it. Linode.com slash land. That's where you get the $100 and 60-day credit, and you can kick the tires yourself. Linode.com slash land. And thank you to Collide. Endpoint security doesn't have to be a battle between IT admins and end users. Collide does things differently. Collide provides user-centered solutions for companies that slack. Users will receive security recommendations, and Collide will automatically notify your team 
when their devices are insecure and give them step-by-step -step instructions on how to fix the problem. And Collide's dashboard allows IT admins to easily monitor the security of the entire fleet, whether they're on Mac, Windows, or, yes, Linux. With Collide, you can build a culture of security and meet your compliance goals. Go try it out for free at collide.com slash LAN and get a goodie bag just for activating your trial. It's time to put users first with Collide. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash LAN. We end this week with some exciting news from Git the self-hosted GitHub and GitLab alternative. They've announced Git Actions, which are just now in preview. Actions allow users to run workflows for a variety of events in a repo. You know, things like building your code, running your tests, making new releases, or building new container images, or heck, maybe even deploying some code to a Linode server, say. Actions and CICD tooling generally seems to be one of the most requested features that so far has been missing, at least in some users' minds, from Gitty. And that makes sense because... Git is often used as a self-hosted replacement for services like GitHub and GitLab, which, of course, have had those features for a while. So far, Git version has three main parts. The first is a definition and the implementation for what they call the Git Actions Protocol. This is also what you could use if you were a third-party CID system. This is also what you could use if you're a third-party CICD system if you wanted to push your results right into Git. Then there's a new runner built for Gitty and a new actions management subsystem to help you keep track and organize all those actions. Something that stands out to me with Gitty's version of actions is it looks like they're aiming to be compatible with GitHub actions. That's pretty smart since there's a lot of adoptions over there. They support the YAML workflow format. They're compatible with most existing actions plugins that are in the GitHub marketplace. And it seems this is possible because under the hood, it's all powered by Gitty's new runner which is based on ACT, an open source project which lets you run GitHub Actions locally. The project also notes that Git the Actions go beyond just DevOps, saying, quote, it lets you run workflows when other events happen in your repository. For example, you can run a workflow to automatically add the repository labels whenever someone creates a new issue in your repository. Now, of course, GitHub's version of this has become really popular in the last few years. I mean, heck, we use it at Jupyter Broadcasting behind the scenes to generate updates to our website when a new podcast comes out. That's just one small example of all the crazy use cases these kind of automation tools are used for these days. So I think that's why it's really nice to see Gitty's take on this for self-hosted users. Sure, it's just a preview. There's a lot more to come. But it's nice to have a little more feature parity because Gitty, I mean, it's growing in popularity. And it's just a much lighter weight option compared to something like GitLab, which has had powerful CI/CD features for a long time, but is a lot more to manage if you're just hosting it for yourself. Yeah, this is a lot simpler to get started with. Uh, probably makes sense for smaller teams or an individual. And to the broader point, you know, it's nice to have both be really competitive and both be broadly feature complete and have some feature parity for the self-hosted options, because I think that's probably, from a market perspective, the best way to keep this type of tooling totally decentralized, and, well, at least as decentralized as reasonably possible, and not completely owned and locked up by Microsoft and GitHub. That's the beauty of all this. So that's one of the reasons this excites me and why we're keeping an eye on it. We'll continue to watch it, see where things go, and let you know. So be sure you don't miss a single episode of Linux Action News. Go to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch and let us know about what wacky things you're using Actions for. And just for a few more days, you can go to jupiter.party and sign up with the promo code 2022 and take $2 off the lifetime membership price every single month. Take a couple bucks off for the lifetime of your membership at jupiter.party. It's a great way to get every single show ad-free including this year Linux Action News. And don't worry, we'll be back next week with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. And that's all the news for this week.